Welcome to From Page to Stage, our annual showcase of works in progress. As with the majority of events this year and last, we are having to become more familiar with the virtual world and the challenges that this technology can present. Technological challenges can be overcome though, and all involved, writers and actors alike, were keen to be able to present the work, especially as the event required to be cancelled last year. The BioWriters Group embraces and supports all kinds of writing and writers, so this year we're delighted to include poems and pieces of reflection alongside monologues and scripts. Many thanks to the actors from St Andrew's Play Club for transforming our work into entertaining performances. For more information about the BioWriters and St Andrew's Play Club, please visit our websites. New members are always welcome. We look forward to welcoming you back to the Bayer for Live Theatre, hopefully in the not too distant future. Allure file by Catherine Home. Betty opens the front door to find a police officer standing there. Oh my goodness, what's happened? Gerald, Gerald, come quick, it is the police. No, I don't know why they're here. Look, turn that damn TV off, we've got a guest. Come through, come through. Excuse the mess, it is Wednesday. Coffee morning at the village hall, and I don't get chance to tidy up until well after lunch. Gerald, move those papers off the sofa and give him space to sit. Tea? No. Coffee then? No, it's no trouble. Gerald will put the kettle on, won't you, love? <laughs> then me and you can have a chat. So, what's happened? You can tell me. Is it about the flower beds? I told Lily last week about those ruffians trampling on her marigolds. Didn't get a good look, I'm afraid. Most youths look the same these days, don't they? All lanky and pale. <laughs> Not the flower beds. Dog poo, then. I can give you a list as long as your arm of offenders, and that Mavis from the end house there is right at the top. Cats? Well, I suppose it might be cat poo. How can you tell? Is it smaller, less brown? Or the disappearing cats? <laughs> now, Rita's cat went missing. I'm not surprised, to be honest, as she forgot to feed it. Spent half the time roaming around neighbours' houses crying. It's probably died of starvation in someone's garden. Hope they find it before they mow the lawn. Or a man. Oh, let's see. Oh, it's not a very good photo, is it? I, I can barely see his face. Could be anyone. What do you think, Gerald? Jonathan? Jonathan who? Jackson? Well, I suppose it could be. No. Didn't he go to live in York after his mum died and left everything to charity? Oh, what a to-do that was! Bless her. She was a right character, that Stella. Her and her beloved cats. Oh, my gosh, you don't think. No, he wouldn't, would he? Well, I never. Stella will be turning in her grave. What's he been doing to the cats, do you think? You couldn't eat that many, could you? Oh, I feel all queasy thinking about it. Put me right off my food, that has, and it's Maggie's turn to bake today, and she's pretty good. Not like some of the others, naming no one, but don't be accepting any buns from her next door. Talk about lardy. <sighs> well, if I see Jonathan, I'll tell him you're after him, shall I? No. Oh, I see. We'll call again any time. I'll let Lily know you're on to the flower tramplers. <laughs> Gerald, can you see this nice officer out? I I've got a few phone calls to make. Musings in Lockdown During the Covid-19 Pandemic by Jennifer Ray. Sunny Easter Sunday, my garden, quiet and still. Sometimes a place of consolation, 
often a place for reflection, always a place of inspiration. Today, a place of peace for meditation. You ask me what I know. I know that night follows day, as before. I know that spring follows winter, as before. I know that nothing has changed, yet nothing goes on, as before. You ask me what I think. I think our home, this world, we have ravaged is crying, mercy, stop. No more can I support you, you must atone. You ask me what I feel. I feel my human frailty, powerless in the relentless onslaught of ruthless nature. I feel the grim reaper grinning at my shoulder. You ask me what I hope. I hope that humankind will realise in time the errors of its selfishness and greed. I hope the four horsemen will gallop on by this time. Strawberry Tart Fiasco by Gavin Yule. Annie comes through her kitchen door. She washes her hands. On the counter, there's the covered up plate. She lifts the cloth slightly and recoils in shock. No, 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 no! This is outrageous! Jimmy? Jimmy, I know you're up there. Get your bahookie down these stairs right now. Oh, Mum, the wrestling's on. Oh, they're getting fierce this week, Red Hot. Fierce, are they? That's just what I'll be if you're not down here in three seconds. One, two... I'm coming, I'm coming. What's this? Oh, it wasn't me. I've been out all day. Oh, really? Who was it then? The cake fairies? No, it was, uh, it was a pair of raccoons. Raccoons? Aye, raccoons. I've seen them down at the river. They, they must have been quick. I didn't even see them. Jimmy, do you think I was born yesterday? Do you? Of course not. Then you must think I'm stupid. Because you've just told me you've been working all day. Yet you just said you didn't even see the raccoons. There were no raccoons, were there? Except the one in front of me. Oh, Mum. Oh, Mum, nothing. First the tub of flora, and now this. It was crumbling, so I just thought... It was meant to be crumbling. The clue is in the title. Look. Crumbly strawberry tart cake. Well, that's my first prize aspirations out of the window. All work, all week I work breathlessly on this. Can't you make something else? No. There's a set list. Everyone is doing everything else. I'll never live this down. Magenta will be laughing on the other side of her face. Magenta? Magenta. Is she that woman from m &S who was on Bake Off? Yes. Won it as well. Wins the competition every year. This year, I really thought I was in with a chance. I'd finally wiped the smirk off Magenta Maguire's face, but not now. Look, Mum. Why don't you just use a recipe off the internet? That's cheating, and I'm not a cheater. Is it the competition tomorrow? Turn that laptop on. Copy in the Cathedral by Roger Knight. On our weekly trips to St Andrews, once we've completed our errands, we order our takeout coffees and head for the ruined sanctuary of St Andrew's Cathedral. Against a south-facing wall, there is a row of benches seldom used. Here we can sit, looking out across the remnants of a cathedral that still affords an atmosphere of ravaged grandeur and tranquillity. It is a refuge from all the unrelenting noise of these trying times, providing the perfect antidote. With the faint warmth of winter sun on our faces, 
we gradually absorb the ambience and sense of history reflected around us. These magnificent ruins now stand as though in silent tribute to the events that took place here hundreds of years ago. Slowly sipping our coffee, we start to feel enveloped by the solemnity of history and think that we now share that same fear of pestilence, uncertainty and upheaval of those who went before us. So in some sense, history does repeat itself, despite the advances of civilization. For the first time, my Weltschmerz begins to lift slightly and seems almost irrelevant compared to the endeavours that took place here centuries past. I start to realise that I'm just passing through, among the pressing billions, and that my existence is of little consequence in the overall scheme of things. We leave with an invigorated, wider perspective, feeling a little more buoyant. Caroline's Cake by Catherine Holm Mum? Pick up! It's an emergency! Chloe's friends are going to be here in an hour and the cake's a disaster. It's, it's all sloppy. I know you sent me the link to Mary Berry's Quick Bakes, but Chloe wanted the unicorn cake she'd seen on Instagram. It needed five eggs, which seems a lot. Anyway, the mixture's still runny and, and it's been in for ages. Should I add more flour? Or should I put it into two tins so that it, it bakes quicker? Oh, Mum, help me. I don't want her friends making fun of her for having the worst cake ever. She'll be a social outcast and it's all my fault. Oh, oh, wait. The oven's not on. Panic over. When I lifted the hat box down from the top of the wardrobe this morning, a thrill of excitement and great anticipation rippled through me. Today is going to be really special. The service is to be held in St Michael's, followed by a reception at the Royal. Oh, I love the Royal. Large rooms with high ceilings, plenty of room for a crowd to mingle, and excellent food. St Michael's is a favourite as well. Beautiful stained glass to study if, if things drag on a bit, especially as the vicar there is rather fond of the sound of his own voice. It's been ages since I've worn my pink hat. Oh, look at these lovely flowers round the brim and the netting. Oh, smashing. Oh, I normally wear far more conservative looking ones. When I place it at a jaunty angle, <laughs> I remember my poor old Harold. Oh, he loved to see me wearing this pink hat. Said I looked very regal. I do miss him. I wonder what he'd make of my new hobby. Probably tell me I need my head examined. But it keeps me busy every week, happy and out and about. And I met some lovely people. Now, nearly time to go, if I'm to be in my seat before the family arrive at church. I've memorised the names of the children and grandchildren and all the other relevant things, and I've popped some cash in my bag, ju just a modest amount for the collection. St Michael's is needing work done on the organ and the roof, I heard last week. Right, I think that's just me just about ready. I'll just check the notice again. Suddenly but peacefully, on March the 7th, Gloria Shepherd, aged 82, widow of James, beloved mother of Anne and Belinda, and loving grandmother to Neil, Sasha and Laura. Funeral at St Michael's Church, Broad Street at 11am, and thereafter at the Royal Hotel. All family and friends invited. Family flowers only. Please wear something colourful. <laughs> There's another two I've circled here in the local paper for later in the week, but I don't think they'll be as good as this one. But you never know. Some are enormous fun with the sherry flowing and even some singing. 
At least I won't have to worry about cooking for myself. It's quite easy to fill your plate with food and always have your mouth full to avoid awkward conversations. I always tell the family that I'm an old friend or former work pal of mum's. I've become very skilled over the past few months and always know when it's time to make my escape, especially if anyone looks as though they're getting a bit suspicious. I make it a rule never to go to the funeral of men. That might just raise some eyebrows with the widows, and I would hate to cause a scene. I'm always respectful, and I look respectable, and I never overdo the tears. I always have a clean and neatly ironed hanky in my bag if I feel the need to dab my eyes. So, off to see the late Gloria on her way. Bless her, whoever she was. Lovely day for it. <laughs> the Adriatic Sea washes into St Mark's Basilica. Its marble columns, which once symbolised Venetian power for a millennium, are crumbling away. The outback towns of Bogabilia and Good and Windy could soon be abandoned as river systems face collapse. The scale and intensity of bushfires are no longer a seasonal event. Cities are being engulfed in toxic smoke haze as bushfires rage on for weeks at a time. Some of Sydney's beaches are becoming clogged with black ash that laps the shore. Even the Florida Everglades are dying out. The Larsen B ice shelf in the Antarctic is expected to disintegrate next year, adding further to sea level rises. Already, eight islands in the Pacific Ocean have disappeared and large coastal communities are under imminent threat. And yet, we still bury our heads in the sand, continuing to feed our rapacious appetites for burning coal with no inclination to curb our relentless consumerism of goods that we don't really need many of which we will eventually discard, adding to an ever-increasing detritus, much of which is ecologically harmful. We may well have already passed the point of any recovery to save our ailing planet, which has existed for four billion years. Mankind might just succeed in making it completely uninhabitable. Though not in our lifetimes, which, in a perverse way, supports our denial. Not heeding the warnings from climatologists and scientists will ultimately be at our own peril. Our uh, getting and spending has to change. We have to start taking care of something much more important than ourselves if life on this planet is to be sustained. Easy Does It by Emma Cameron I don't usually shake down old ladies, but she was asking for it. I have my reputation to think of. Aren't I a genius in the art of deception? Don't I always come up the readies when I need them? I've been perfecting the whiskey corn for years. OK, I'm only small time, but I'm the best. Take this latest shakedown. The guy in the train was only too willing to give me all the information I need. So I look up his folk's name in the book and I pay them a visit. It has to be through the day so the old man's out and his boy is at work. I'm in luck. The old lady answers the door. She's got people in the house with her. Two other old broads. I tell her I'm a friend of her son's. I point to the brooch I wear on my lapel that says Shivers Regal. Jim asked me to get him a couple of bottles of whiskey but he forgot to give me the money. I'd put up for it myself, but I make a strict rule never to do that as so many people ask me to get them stuff. She looks a bit uncomfortable, and I know she doesn't trust me. So I go in for the kill. Look, I say to her, you don't know me from Adam, so I'll just mosey along until I see Jim myself. I ask her to tell Jim that he'll have to wait until the following month until he gets another chance to get his cheap booze. Oh, she says, did Jim expect it sooner? <laughs> I think he wanted it for a party he was going to. Come into the house and tell me a bit about yourself, son. She takes my arm and pushes me into the house where the other two old women were sitting drinking tea. I introduce myself and set out to charm the pants off them. Well, not really. More like squeeze the dosh out of them. 
I make up a story as to how I met Jim Scott. It was colourful. It was funny. It was good and they fell for it. His old lady asks me to tell her how I can get this cheap whisky for her son. I tell her I'm entitled to 12 bottles of whisky a month. Perks of the job, you know. I don't drink the stuff myself. That's probably how they gave me a job with the company. I sell it on cheaply to get money to help my mother. She's in a nursing home, you know. I could hardly stop myself from laughing as the old biddies showed their sympathies. I played my ace card and was now waiting for the jackpot. It came immediately. How many bottles did my son order and how much are the daily? asked Mrs Scott. Three, I answered, and that will be £24. She looks at me with pleading eyes. Do you think you could spare another couple of bottles for my husband as a wee treat? I just picked up my pension this morning. Well, all right, I say, just this one, seeing it's for a treat. She hands over 40 quid, making me give my word that I won't get into trouble for doing this. I give her a peck on the cheek and assure her it will be okay. The other two old ladies are going into the handbags and taking out their pension money. Please, can you get us two bottles each as well, just this once? I throw my hands in the air. Ladies, ladies, very well. I might as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb. The lady settled up with me and I left with another 32 quid promising to return the following day. <laughs> 72 quid. That's a lot of spondula for a guy like me. I finish my drink and make for the train take me back to Glasgow. It's not too wise to stay in town after you've just made a score. I'll keep my badge on just in case. You never know when you'll meet the next sucker. If you're wondering, do I feel guilty taking money off those old ladies? I do a little, but if they hadn't been so greedy, they wouldn't have been so eager to part with their money. I cheat, I steal, and I lie for a living. But hey, that's life. Tea Time by Jennifer Ray. Aunt Ella was a lady. She'd invite her friends for tea. Her homemade scones were a legend and as dainty as can be. Uncle John was a tall man with an appetite for three. He'd fit a scone into each cheek and hope she wouldn't see. Then, hamster-like, he'd sit there with a child upon each knee. He did this to amuse us, of that I am quite sure. He was a naughty child at heart, was part of his allure. Aunt Ella was not fooled by him. She was a wise old bird. She'd overlook his childish pranks, though thought them quite absurd. Posh friends did not think much of him. In all honesty and truth, they thought he was a foolish man with manners quite uncouth. To us, he was a hero. What more is there to tell? He was our own Pied Piper and St. Christopher as well. Night Rides and Dawn by Catherine Holm. Dawn and her daughter Flora are having a Zoom conversation. Hi Flora love, how are things with you? Hi mum, we're okay. Although the, the kids are driving me mad now, it's half term. Jack's taken to playing the PlayStation all day and Ella is obsessed with TikTok. Every time I do something, she films me. She uploaded a video of me unloading the washing machine the other day whilst I was breathlessly singing along to Abba's Dancing Queen. The size of my bum. I really need to lay off the chocolate digestives. Oh, I'm the same. Your dad keeps buying strawberry cheesecake. Been eating it every day since the first lockdown. Good job I do Zumba Gold twice a week or I'd be huge. Anyway, how was your birthday tea? Mark was planning something special, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, until he realised it clashed with a Liverpool match. Ended up with my tea on a tray on the sofa, where I would be more comfortable, apparently. Bloody football. What did he cook? <sighs> He heated up some Fisher and Donaldson sausage rolls. The blast of things kept crumbling. I'm going to be finding pastry flakes on the cushions on the sofa for the next month. Any nice prezzies? M&S vouchers from the kids. 
A set of saucepans from Mark. When did I get so old, Mum? Oh, don't be knocking it on the desk, Flora. Good quality stuff. I've had these tr trousers for over 30 years now. Really comfy. Did you like the bag I got you? About that bag? If you're not keen on the colour, I can swap it. I thought teal might be nice for spring, brighten you up a bit. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Well, you do wear a lot of black. You do know it's a myth, don't you? Well, what is? That black is slimming. You can still see rolls of fat hanging over your waistband. Mum, that's outrageous! Oh, just being honest, that's part of my role as a mother. So, do you not like teal? I could get you a red one easily. Or a blue, yellow. Who has a yellow handbag, I ask you? Dove grey, black, navy or magenta. Uh, I'll have to check on that one, as Phyllis has got first dibs. I just wondered where you got it from. Why? Well, it's a bit awkward. I think you may have purchased stolen goods. It looks like a counterfeit. Well, of course it's a fake. As if I can afford the original. These were great value, and I sell them on for a tidy profit. You're a dodgy dealer. Mum, listen to the fierce tone of my voice when I tell you this is completely unacceptable. You can't give me knockoffs for my birthday. But why not? You didn't complain at Christmas, did you? What? what? I thought you ordered that online from River Island. I've worn that coat out in public, Mother, in the school playground and, and at work. You know, in my role as a trading standards officer. Bet it kept you warm, though. Flora? Flora! Instead, by Roger Knight. I never did learn to play the electric guitar or parachute from a plane, nor travel to the edge of space. Instead, I have watched a few sunrises and sunsets, the sort that reaches into your soul. I've lived on mountains, in desert and the bush, and discovered their individual duendes that enrich and endure. I didn't master French, or Arabic, or even Excel. Instead, I've tried to connect with others, and with some, helped to ease their woe. I didn't make much money, that was never my goal. Instead, I have learnt to live with less and appreciate nature's gold. My life's testimony, as it draws to a close, was freely chosen, which matters more, and is no train wreck either. What becomes of our spent years? I imagine they ought to have a fitting resting place, like those discarded planes silently parked in the Mojave Desert, in expired formation. Their usefulness expended, their unique identity, though faded from the desert sun, still intact. There are only the empty echoes left of their former purpose, akin to our memories of past events that we mark by years. I realise now, with the passage of time, that robust health eventually caves in and that ageing creeps up on you. The remaining time in which to make a difference or succeed in some way may be a bridge too far. But I have loved and been loved and lived in places well beyond where I was born. I am the product of my spent years and celebrate the fact with this poem. Coffee in the Sun by Gavin Yule The scene takes place in a cafe in Glasgow. Kathy, the owner, is sitting at one of the tables with a cup of coffee. People forget where they come from sometimes. Had a couple in this morning. Quite well to do. He had a lovely suit on, looked expensive. Could have been a school teacher. Except his socks were around his ankles. She was a lovely looking thing, quite petite. Could have passed for one of those lasses of the television. Lovely looking eyes. Anyway, they come in, sit down, 
and I knew there'd be trouble right away. Now, it's not as if the place is untidy. It was their attitude. It was as if this place wasn't good enough for the likes of them. So I put on one of my always here to help smiles and go over and take the order. They look at the menu for a minute and then wait for this. They ask if I have any lap sang so chong. I said, I beg your pardon. He says, have you got any lap sang so chong? Speaks to me as if I'm foreign. I said, sir, if you'll forgive me, this is a cafe in Soaky Hill Street in Glasgow. It is no Buckingham Palace. If it's not on the menu, I don't do it. Well, he looks at me as if I've just slapped him across his face. When Madam suddenly throws her head back and announces she's late for a hair appointment. Likewise, Sir suddenly remembers he should be on a train to Edinburgh, and the two of them turn on their heels and depart. Didn't even bother to say thank you. Typical. Still, it's not always like that. I do have my regulars. There's old Mrs. McIntosh, been coming in here since I first bought this place. Must be 20 years now. Always the same order, tea and toast. Every morning, nine on the dot, without fail. She's down in the dumps most of the time, but she's right enough. Had a wee disappointment with a soldier in the Second World War. You'd never think it, though. She doesn't like to talk about it. Then there's Mr. and Mrs. Marston, lovely couple, and Sandra, shy with thing, but born with thing. Aye, we're a happy band of brothers here. She goes over to the door and turns the sign from open to closed. She looks out of the window. Hello, what's this? New car just pulled up opposite? Not from round here. I know all the cars from here, practically. Looks Spanish, maybe? A lovely colour. <sighs> People don't have to chance it sometimes. A couple of young boys in just now, looking for two of my luxury milkshakes. They're a heart attack waiting to happen, I think. Uh, who am I to deny anyone? So, as my back was turned, the wee chancer ran back here, managed to get the teal open and fled. Well, I know I shouldn't, but I couldn't let them get away with that, could I? And so I gave chase. Of course, it was no use. They were a lot faster than me, so what chance did I have? I came back in, and old Mrs. McIntosh, who has been sitting watching the whole thing, says to me, If they wear my wings, I'd box their ears. <laughs> I said, That's all very well, dear, but you need to remember that times have changed. She says, Aye, well, I'll turn them back for you. <laughs> She's good-hearted. Actually, it wasn't all bad news. Turns out I have a knight in shining armor. Sergio, his name is Spanish. Turns out he'd seen the whole thing from across the street. So the two rascals ran out and gave chase. Got my money back? No problem. He looked a bit shattered after it. So I let him have a sit down. Says he grew up in Mijas, mother was a carpenter and his father was in car sales. I said, what made you come over here? He said, dear lady, Mijas shall have my soul, but my, my body and brain shall have a venture. Quite a handsome young man. Quite tall. A voice to die for. I could listen to it all day. My card, he says, and pushes it towards me. Just as I picked up, he takes my hand and says, Dear lady, I take one look at these, and I see these belong to a woman who uses them a great deal. I said, Well, get to you, Casanova. And he threw back his head and laughed. I gave him a glass of water. But as he was counting out his money, I said, On the house, just this once. <laughs> he said, My dear woman, I thank you. May I ask your name? I said, it's Cathy. He looked at me with these crystal blue eyes and said, Dear Cathy, I shall call again. And he bows his head and out he goes. Mrs. McIntosh, who's been watching the whole thing, snorts and says, Be careful there, love. I said, what? We were just talking. 
she said, I, that's how it always starts. <laughs> There's always something with her. Consider the Jester by Jennifer Ray. Consider the Jester, the fool, the clown. His folly is your amusement, is it not? He beguiles you with his grin. He charms you with his words. He fixes you with an eye. He fools you with a sleight of hand. Don't be deceived. You are his plaything. He is toying with you. For he is practised in his art, and that is one of deception. You laugh at his antics. His buffoonery blinds you with his intentions. But the asinine ears can change in a flash to the horns of the goat. He is the master trickster. Beware of the jester. He is the devil in disguise. Penny Pinches by Catherine Holm. Anne is sitting at a table in a cafe, drinking tea, glancing at the door, checking her watch. She gives a smile as Joan walks over to the table. I thought no one was coming. Not like you to be the first one here. Janice next door gave me a lift. She's on her way to Dundee for a meeting about timeshares. Oh, whereabouts? Spain, I think. Or, or it might be the Algarve. I did warn her it's all a con, but she thinks she knows best what with that win on the lottery. How much was it again? £5,391.61p. and p. Oh, nice amount. I treat myself to a new dryer. Still playing up? Oh, God, yes. Everything's still damp. I asked Michael to have a look, but apparently it's not his area of expertise. Cheryl says I should stop pestering him. But isn't that the whole point of having a son-in-law? And he is a plumber, so it's right up his street. Lazy so-and-so. Morning. You're early, Anne. Got a lift in. Lucky you. I was waiting ages for the 64. Penny was on it. She said she'll be in soon. She has to put to boots for her cream. She's still got that rash. Oh, good grief. My Aunt Doris had a rash like that shortly before she died. Gave me the creeps it did. Her face was all blotchy and swollen. Why she doesn't go to the doctors is beyond me. She died in 1982. Not Doris, Penny. I've told her umpteen times, but she won't go. My Harold was like that, stubborn git. I kept nagging him about his blasted cough. But he just sat there sucking fishermen's friends. I could have belted him. I was right though, wasn't I? Guess who I saw yesterday? Beryl. Is she the one with the stick? No, that's Brenda. Beryl, huge wig, enormous glasses. From the knitting club? Yes, her. Anyway, I bumped into her in Morrison's. She was all tanned. Said she'd been living in Benidorm for the past three years, just popped over for Fiona's funeral. Is that Fiona from the flats? No, you're thinking of Siobhan, the Irish lady. Fiona was the one with the Dalmatian. When did she die? A couple of weeks ago. Slipped on an icy patch outside Costa, bashed her head on a litter bin. Oh, nasty. You who, ladies? Got your cream then, Penny? Yes, thanks. It was on special offer too, 10p off. It was still pricey though, I bet. You should just get it on prescription. Oh, I, I don't pay for it. Well, what do you mean? Well, I just knock a few items off the shelf and make sure the cream lands in my handbag. You stole it? Always do. I can't afford £3.99 for a tiny tube of cream. I'm on a pension. But don't you feel guilty? Not a chance. I've spent thousands over the years on hay fever tablets, cough mixture, and God knows what else when the boys were ill. Good morning, beautiful ladies. What's all the whispering about then? Admiring my physique, no doubt. <laughs> Laughing at it, more like. Penny was confessing to a crime. It's all very hush-hush. Oh, let me guess. 
You didn't scan all the items in your basket at Tesco. It's much worse than that, Derek. Penny pinched something. Eh? From boots. What was it then? Perfume? Bumper pack of tenor lady? Major language, Derek. Her spot cream, actually. Christ, is that all? You lot need to get out more if you think that's exciting. Morning Treat by Roger Knight. After rising and showering each morning, I give the doggies breakfast before going out on a walk along the old railway track. Despite his training as a guide dog, he has since turned feral and chases pheasants and deer whenever he sees them. Upon our return, we share together a slice of hot buttered toast and marmalade, which has become something of a daily ritual for us. The sound of the toaster on ejection captures his full attention, and sphinx-like he crouches at my feet as though in supplication, patiently and intently awaiting his portion, drooling all the while with rapt attention. Once gulped down, he licks his chops in appreciation, and I bask in the satisfaction I've begun another day, knowing that I've made this old, retired guide dog's life a little better, and in turn, momentarily, dispelled some of my own gloom. The sheer mutuality and satisfaction uplifts me, and confirms that the smallest things, as well as the most mundane, can still be gifts. I am reminded of that enduring quotation of Emerson's, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. Being Flora by Jennifer Ray. After reading Grace and Perry's autobiography, Freddie made up his mind. If Grace and his hero could win the Turner Prize and receive his award dressed up as his alter ego, Claire, Surely he could pluck up the courage to admit to the world that he too had an alter ego. Her name was Flora. For weeks now, when he was alone in the house, he had been trying on his sister's clothes and using her makeup. She hadn't suspected a thing. It was only a matter of time before she did, though. He knew that. Jay could be so fierce if she thought anyone had been in her room. The thought of her reaction to his present activities didn't bear thinking about. One last time and I'll come clean, he told himself, looking in the mirror and stretching his lips to apply the magenta-coloured lipstick, his sister's favourite. Maybe I should try the pink one instead, the one called Strawberry Sorbet. Jade doesn't wear that one so often, he thought. No, the magenta one is my favourite too. Go on, make a statement for a lot. You know you want to break out and be outrageous. Outrageous is exactly how he felt the last time he'd worn one of Jade's bras stuffed with toilet paper. That day he had chosen the suspender belt and stockings in preference to footless tights. For the sake of authenticity, he momentarily thought about shaving his legs. No, maybe not. That would raise eyebrows in the boys' changing room. Then came the stiletto-heeled shoes. The wig Jade had worn for a fancy dress party really transformed him, he thought. It completed the look that he desired, and for the first time, he dared to venture out as Flora. A walk on the tarmac path by the river was to be her debut into the world. It was normally quiet there and close to where he lived. He was just getting the hang of tottering along in these high-heeled shoes when somebody wolf whistled from the other side of the river and shouted, what you doing tonight, darling? Turning her head towards the sound, she saw two fishermen on the opposite bank. Flora stumbled in surprise and felt her confidence crumbling at the nature of the attention she was attracting. What should she do? Is this the treatment girls had to put up with? Wondered Freddie, and in that moment, the full realisation of his situation dawned on him. Not only was he being mocked, 
but he was being mocked by the fifth form bully, Tyrone Motley, and his dad. Instead of brazening it out, as Freddie imagined Flora might do, he fled back the way he'd come in the hope that he had not been recognized, stopping only briefly to take off the instruments of torture his sister called shoes. <clears throat> Breathlessly and thankfully, he reached their back door in his bare feet before the rest of the family arrived home. Pity about the stockings, they'd been reduced to shreds. He'd get rid of them in next door's bin. His feet were in tatters too, having sprinted the 200 meters between his house and the river. There was just enough time to wash the makeup off and change into his own clothes again before his father got home ahead of his sister and mother. Hey Fred, did you get your homework done then? Fred's dad took off his jacket, hung it up and turning towards his son said, What's that on your lip? You've had beetroot for lunch again, haven't you? Uh, yeah, you're right, I, I did, muttered Freddy, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand and examining it. He followed his father into the kitchen, and without facing him, but opening the fridge door instead, looked aimlessly inside and said, Dad, can we have a chat? Reflections by Catherine Home. I'm sick of my job. Everyone's always like, oh, you're so lucky, Sharon, working in a clothes shop. Bet you get loads of free knickers and stuff. And I'm like, fat chance of that. Don't get me started on the customers. Stuck up a lot of them. Never say please or tar. This morning, I saw someone sneaking into the fitting room with a zillion items. Oi, you! I yelled across the shop floor. She stopped. She saw me. I know she saw me. But then headed for cubicle four, the largest one. I'm saying nothing about her size, but you know, she's huge. Anyway, I caught up to her because I'm actually quite fit with that Zumba twice a week. How many items have you got there, madam? I asked. Four, she said, big fat liar. Clearly she had about 50. Let me see then, I said. Well, all hell broke loose and she demanded to see the manager. It took me ages to find Oakless Harry. Dread to think what he's added to my personal file. Next, I heard a little, hello, coming from cubicle two, followed by hysterical sobbing. Dear God, poor thing was trapped in a top. I've seen it umpteen times. Why people think they are going to fit into a size eight is beyond me. Blasted thing wouldn't budge. I had to yank the top as best I could. There was an almighty rip. And well, it wouldn't be proper for me to comment on the bra I saw. She then had the nerve to ask for the top in the next size up. Felt like saying, go to the mirror. Have you seen your bingo wings? Off I went, bringing it back in a 14, saying it was the only size available. To be fair, it looked lovely on her. This afternoon, I had a woman dithering over which dress to get. I felt like saying, look at them. They're all the same. Black, long sleeves, hem to the floor. Look like tents. But no. She kept asking me to find her other similar dresses, so I had to traipse down to formal wear and back about 10 times. And guess what? She bought the first dress she tried on. To top it off, I had to get involved in some conflict revolution. Resolution, oh, one of the two. 
This granny came in determined to choose items for her granddaughter. You know, cutesy dresses and matching hairbands and stuff. The look on the girl's face, you could tell she was clearly not happy at all. So I says to granny, look, my Tracy wouldn't be seen dead in all those types of clothes. I let my kids choose clothes from wherever they want. So long as it's Sports Direct or Primark. <laughs> well, Granny got in a big huff, dumped the clothes on the floor and stormed off. Girl gave me a big thumbs up, <laughs> which made my day. You know what? I quite like my job. Just glad to get that off my chest. Best get back to work. Noli me tangere by Roderick Knight. A significant component of loneliness throughout this pandemic has been the absence of non-verbal human contact. The handshake, a hug, even a reassuring touch on the arm or a pat on the back is now considered off limits, forbidden fruit. As a consequence, our sense of isolation, concomitant social change that has ensued, is accentuated. A major way we express ourselves as human beings has become stifled, constrained, and even muzzled by social distancing because of COVID, to the extent that we face a new form of COVID-induced anomaly as our social bonds with our significant others and community weaken. Introspection and a melancholic outlook of society begins to crowd in, exacerbated by our incessant doom scrolling on our phones, which have become our inseparable companions as we live out our days in a virtual social world, fixated by the contents revealed to us on our palm-sized screens. The nostalgia for human contact that comforts, uplifts, heals and spells loneliness is embodied in a hug that's beginning to be consigned to human history, which is why the value of it should be frequently evoked and never forgotten. I always remember the story of a young Saudi man living in Riyadh, advertising free hugs to passers-by. He had no shortage of willing participants, but was subsequently arrested because giving public hugs in Saudi Arabia is haram, as dictated by Islamic law, not COVID. An example of how much people were in need of a hug, even from a stranger. In my lonely hug-starved COVID world, I remind myself of what it felt like to be hugged before COVID-19 came along. It was like jump-starting a dead car battery in celebration of an embrace. The longest and tightest embrace I ever felt endured long after its physical ending. In being clasped together, it seemed that our desperations had dissolved, our freedoms regained, and all would be well again. That affirmation of union, of joining together, briefly immunizes against the ills of the world in a healing moment, as though to strengthen us to forge on by, tra by a transfer of energy, comfort, reassurance and total mutuality. An embrace envelops, consumes and sustains us more than a kiss. But a brief time in being sealed together, harmonised, cradled in sublime energy, we are uplifted and restored over and over again. Theatre Calls by Alan Tricker I am ten years old and sitting at my desk in school. Our teacher introduces a man who wants volunteers. We know about volunteering. It usually means an escape from the rather humdrum and routine school day. He asks if any of us can sing. Hands shoot up. 
He then asks if any of the singers would like to take part in a play in a theatre, and if so, could they please stand up? Some of us stand up, and he chooses ten of us, the smallest ones. This is most unusual. Small people are rarely chosen. After school, we have to meet at a house nearby, and we're taught a song by a man in a velvet jacket who played an enormous piano. We are then sent home with a note for our mums, which details when we should be at the theatre for rehearsals. We are to play Field Mice in a production of Toad of Toad Hall, my first show. It was not an altogether entrancing experience. Before the show, we were taken into a room to have ghastly grease paint smeared all over our faces, and then we were kept in the chair store until we were needed on stage. At the end of our particular act, we were then put back in the chair store again. At the end of the show, some evil smelling grease was smeared over our faces to remove the makeup, and we were sent home. We had no idea what the story was about, and overall it was a rather strange experience. But something must have appealed. The bright lights? Being something, someone else? Was this my first experience of being called? Life in theatre always involves waiting for a call. Theatre is ruled by calls. If you have an audition, you hope to get a call back for a second audition. If you are cast in a play, the rehearsals are listed on a call sheet, detailing when you are needed. Everything that happens seems to be governed by calls. Five minutes before the show starts is known as beginners. A beginner's call is when people who start the play have to be ready at the side of the stage, costume perfect, voice and body warmed up and ready to go on stage. Actors must arrive at the theatre before the half-hour call, half an hour before beginners. If you're not in the opening scene, you wait in the dressing room for your call over the tannoy when needed on stage. Mr Tricker, to the stage, please. And then off you go. The real world starts to disappear as soon as you enter the stage door. Life backstage has similarities to real life in that people are wearing normal clothes, chatting and making tea, but the normalities of the real world start to vanish as people change into costumes, put on makeup, do strange and wonderful voice warm ups, go over their lines and get nervous. They get nervous because soon they will look and act like somebody else and need to be ready for their call to enter another and completely different world, the world created on stage. Here the people who came through the stage door do not exist. They may look the same, but they will probably say and do things that they would never say or do in the real world. The world on stage is created. Someone has crafted what it looks like. Someone else has written what the actors say, and yet another has decided how they move and what they do. People on stage may appear real, but they are very different from the real people they are normally. For a start, they know what is going to be said, and also what they are going to reply even before it is said, and yet they must make it look like a spontaneous conversation. The stage environment is never a safe environment, however. In a performance, an actor may do or say something they have never done or said before. Something that isn't even in the script. And then the other actors have to respond and carry on regardless. The story must be told. It is also a scary place as there is yet another world beyond the stage that observes everything that is going on the world of the audience. The audience is usually shrouded in darkness, while the stage is in bright light, so that the audience can hear and see everything. The stage world can rarely see the audience world. 
the performance is a shared experience between the actors and the audience. The performance needs both. All actors will say that the most exciting place in a theatre is on the stage in a blaze of bright lights. That's why they want to act. But for me, the most magical place is the wings, the space at the side of the stage. It is both magical and safe as it sits between two worlds. The world of bright light created on stage, which is scary but enticing, and the backstage world, which is much more normal and safe. You can stand there in the wings between two worlds and observe both worlds. In the wings you feel completely in control and safe. You have prepared your voice and body in a warm-up. You look as you need to look in the stage world. No one bothers you in the wings. Everyone knows you need to concentrate on remembering what you're going to do when you step into the light of the stage world. You have received your call to the stage and you wait to hear your cue, the call, so that you can step forward into the light of another world on stage, to be seen, heard and to play your part in yet another story. <laughs>